Hi guys, it's me, Orion. In this video, I'll talk about DLP, an important practice aimed at protecting your business critical information. I'll also share some key use cases, best practices, and finally, the three types of DLP solutions you might consider. But before I do, remember to subscribe to our channel. As I mentioned just now, Data Loss Prevention, or DLP, is an approach to business information protection. It prevents end users from moving essential information outside an organization's network. DLP also refers to tools that network administrator uses to monitor data accessed or shared by end users. Common DLP solutions let you monitor data and system access, filter data streams to restrict suspicious or unidentified activity, log and report incident response and auditing, analyze vulnerabilities and suspicious behavior, as well as provide forensic context to security teams. Let's look at some use cases. DLP lets you identify deviations from security policies, thereby making it easier to correct misconfigurations, compare current configurations to compliance standards, and provide proof of measures taken. Increase visibility across systems, helping you ensure your data is secure no matter where it's stored. An organization's staff is privy to information they can share. This can lead to accidental or intentional data loss. The distributed nature of today's computing system magnifies this problem. Staff working from home access stored data through VPNs and cloud services. Laptops and mobile phones contain sensitive information. And all of these endpoints are often vulnerable. It's becoming increasingly difficult to ensure that data is secure, highlighting the importance for a DLP strategy. Let's look at three reasons you would implement a DLP policy if you don't already have one in place. The first is for compliance purposes. Imposed by governments, organizations are subject to mandatory compliance standards such as HIPAA, SOX, and PCI DSS. These often stipulate how businesses should secure personally identifiable information, or PII and other sensitive data. Most DLP tools address the requirements of common compliance standards. Next, your organization may have intellectual property or intangible assets, such as customer lists and business strategies. Unauthorized exposure of this data can be extremely damaging. Accordingly, it's directly targeted by attackers and malicious insiders. A DLP policy can help identify and safeguard essential information assets. The third reason is that implementing a DLP policy can provide insight into how stakeholders use data. But to protect sensitive information, organizations must first know it exists, where it exists, who uses it, and for what purposes. Here are four best practices for implementing DLP. First, determine how sensitive information flows between systems. Identify how information is transferred to its consumers. This will reveal transmission paths and data repositories. Classify sensitive data into categories, such as employee data, intellectual property, and financial data. Investigate and record all data exit points. Organizational processes may not be documented, and not all data movement is the outcome of routine practices. Next, engage IT and business staff during early stages of policy development. You should identify data categories that have been singled out, needed steps to combat malpractice, future DLP strategy growth, requisite steps to take if there is an abnormal occurrence. Before putting your DLP strategy into practice, establish incident management processes and ensure that they're practical for each data category. Now you're ready to ship your DLP implementation by monitoring organizational data. Know that blocking sensitive information too soon or blocking too much may be detrimental to central business activities. Don't try to solve all data protection issues at once. Fine tune and anticipate the effect DLP may have on organizational culture and operations. Start with the low hanging fruit, establish rules and continually improve them. Involve all relevant stakeholders and ensure they provide feedback on new data types, formats or transmission paths that either aren't listed in the current DLP strategy or aren't currently protected. 
DLP tools do have a few limitations. They can only examine encrypted information that they can initially decrypt. If users encrypt data with keys that aren't available to DLP system operators, the information is essentially invisible. DLP tools are generally not useful when working with rich media, such as images and video. This is because they can't parse and classify such content. The solutions are unable to track all types of today's mobile communication. An example are messages sent from a user's private mobile device. There are three types of solutions to consider. The first being network DLP. It protects your organization's network processes, such as web applications, email, and FTP folders. It monitors and provides visibility of all data as it transits across your network. It maintains a detailed database about which data is being used and who is accessing it. Then there is storage DLP. This type provides information about files stored and shared by network users. It enables the viewing of sensitive files shared and stored on the network. And it provides visibility into data stored both on-premises and in the cloud. The third type is endpoint DLP. It monitors workstations, servers, and mobile devices, such as laptops, mobile phones, external hard drives, and USB drives. Installed as an agent, it prevents data leakage from endpoints, and it provides visibility into data stored on endpoints that are located both within and external to your organization. And that's it, a quick start guide to DLP. Feel free to ask any questions you may have in the comments, and I'll answer them for you. And if you liked what you saw, please like this video and subscribe to our channel.